Gresham College presents Debussy, Text and Ideas Singing Le Jet d'eau by Dr. Helen Abbott, the University of Sheffield. So our second speaker um, probably doesn't need any introduction because you've seen her very often. I have to say I'm always impressed that someone who takes the time to organize a conference also uh, manages to give a paper. I think it's a kind of uh, uh, unusual feat and uh, Helen is to be praised for this. Helen Abbott is a lecturer in French at the University of Sheffield. Um, and, uh, but as a performer herself, she has really devoted her career to exploring the intersection of music and literature in song. So that uh, devotion is manifested in her uh, involvement in the Song Arc Art Research Group and in the Oxford Leader Festival, um, and of course uh, in this wonderful conference that she's organized for us uh, this, this weekend. She's published a book on Baudelaire and Mallarmé and the concept of voice, and she's about to bring out a, a book that I think sounds really quite wonderful on the five settings of Baudelaire's La Mort des Amants. Uh, today she's going to speak about another Baudelaire setting. Her title is Singing le jet d'eau, Helen Abbott. Thank you very much. You'll see on my PowerPoint I've slightly expanded the title to perhaps give you a bit more of a clue as to what I'm talking about, or maybe not. The Song Alongside concept, I'll come to that in a bit. Um, you should also on your chairs have um, a very brief handout which has quite a few texts on it. It's the middle column that I'm mostly talking about, but you'll see I will refer to the others as well. So our session today is titled From Text to Performance, and it's true that the normal way we approach songs are to start with the text and work from that to bring it into a performance context. And you often hear professional interpreters of Debussy's song, and indeed many musicologists and literary scholars, enjoining singers to start, first of all, by reading the poetic text before even beginning to sing it. So, for example, Engelbrecht, who advised singers to say the text before singing it, is often considered to be very sound advice. But, of course, it's not quite that simple, and that is to do in part with some of the rather more complex backstories that lead to the, de to the development of a text, especially when that text is not completely stable. And I think there has all too often been a tendency to assume that there is a correct way to read a Baudelaire poem, for example. And indeed, much of the language of many of Debussy's contemporaries, usually uh, his contemporary singers, if you like, so such as Claire Croiser, Jeanne Batory, um, talked of rhythmical precision. So, for example, Claire Croiser talked about um, how Debussy has caught the poet's rhythm so perfectly that the poem can de be declaimed without changing anything in the rhythm, where, in fact, the poem is never able to be that prescriptive, and we only need to read some of the work of some of the scholars in this room, so David Evans' book on, on rhythm and illusion and the poetic idea in this era, um, or Michel Gribensky, who's not here, who's worked, done some very, very detailed work on poetic rhythm in relation to Debussy. But reciting a poem, in fact, throws up all sorts of rhythmical challenges and variations, quite apart from anything to do with other sound patternings, elisions, or indeed meaning. So it's the more recent scholarship that serves as my in impetus today, carried out by other people in this room, so Catherine Bergeron, Milan Feyerak from the musicology camp, I mentioned Dave already, and Joe, who you've just heard, from the poetry camp. Because we're starting to explore how poetic performance practice, if I can dare to call it that, is shaped both by the poetic text and by the song material surrounding it. And so for me, it's a question of exploring the sounding out of a poem, such as Baudelaire's Le Gé d'eau, which I'm chosen as my main case study today. So you've got the full text in your handout, and I've just popped it on two slides here um, with an English translation uh, to the side. It's essentially uh, a simple, light poem. I, we know that because the line lengths are quite short, so the verses are in octosyllables. The refrain, which repeats each time, is in uh, a sort of alternating meter of six and four. Um, and it's the shortest, the poem with the shortest line lengths of the five poems that uh, Debussy chose to set to music. And I've chosen this poem as my main case study because I think it shows us quite a good way of um, approaching singing Debussy. It's really interesting in terms of its scope. 
So and when I talk about this just being an octosyllable short line length, you, you feel it when you read it. I'll just start with the first few lines. Tes beaux yeux sont là, pauvre amante. Reste longtemps sans les rouvrir dans cette pause nonchalante où ta surprise le plaisir. Essentially, each of the verses are constructed where the first four lines are a direct address um, to the poet's lover, mistress, we assume. And the second four lines of each of the verses is then a descriptive. So it's quite similar to what we heard yesterday, Milen's analysis of spleen, having those two um, uh, different positions, if you like. But it's interesting in terms of its scope, because um, on the one hand, this is a, uh, a poem that is set in its sort of Wagnerian scope of the Debussy Sank poem, the Baudelaire. But on the other hand, and to use Robin Holloway's terms here on the top of that slide, Le Gido, with its three verses, each followed by a refrain, is the simplest in form and in style, most premonitory of Debussy's latest songs. So what I'm going to do is look both backwards and forwards in, in order to enable us to uncover a history of a poem's sound world and sound context, which include its very tight relationships with the musical or with song. What I'm essentially going to do is give a potted history of this poem, Le Gé d'eau, which I hope will show you that why we need to start asking slightly different questions about performing Debussy's song. Because I think there is, all, there is a song that already exists behind this all, which I'm going to call a song alongside. And that song alongside stands in relation to all the different performance contexts for Le Gé d'eau as both poem and song. And I'll come back to that context, uh, concept at the end. So I want to start not with Debussy, but with Baudelaire. But not with Baudelaire as a poet, rather with Baudelaire as chansonnier, or uh, songster, if you like to explore why or whether or not there has been a tendency to overlook Baudelaire's early work as a lyricist. So unlike um, Théophile Gautier, there have been quite a few studies on, on Théophile Gautier as uh, someone who wrote versions of his poems as lyrics versus versions of his poems as poetry. Or there have been, there's been some very major studies of Verlaine as well in terms of how he writes for um, lyric environments. But one of the very few scholars to have touched on, in any detail on Baudelaire's engagement with popular song is Graham Robb, who I've quoted next on the slide there, who writes of Baudelaire's attitude towards popular song, especially in the early stages of his career. I'll read in French, you've got the English translation. Contrairement à la plupart de ses contemporains, le jeune Baudelaire n'établit point de distinction nette entre chanson et poésie. Baudelaire, de plus, est loin de penser que la chanson n'est qu'une gaieté niaise. Or, as Brigitte bouffard moret has also suggested, the major poets of the 19th century in France, so from Hugo to Baudelaire to Verlaine and Laforgue, didn't perceive there to be any pronounced aesthetic distinction between the apparently popular lowbrow chanson and their poetry. So again, reading in French and for the English translation, Les poètes du 19e siècle, qui ont été les, les grands acteurs du renouveau poétique, ne traitent pas la chanson comme une forme mineure. Now, we know that Baudelaire's first ever published text was not a poem, but a song. And in fact, it's a parodic song um, based on Béranger's Le Roi d'Yves-Tour, so quite a famous melody in the 19th century. And it was written by Baudelaire in collaboration with Gustave Le Vavasseur in 1844. So against this backdrop of the early stages of, uh, of Baudelaire's career, he was moving in circles which included really quite a large number of light composers. And if we take the example of Le Gé d'eau, the fountain, we have some rather tantalizingly sketchy evidence that the poem in fact started out life as a song. So its pre-publication history in the 1850s is what interests me. I've given you also there the, the actual later publication history, so it's not first published until 1865, which is uh, well after Les Fleurs du Mal was first published and the first and second editions of Les Fleurs du Mal. So basically this poem was never in Les Fleurs du Mal, is my point until the third edition. But looking at the 1850s, well, the 1853 manuscript of this poem that exists um, has with it a musical score entitled Coeur by the light composer Victor Robillard. Now, what we don't know is whether it was written in collaboration with Baudelaire or whether the song existed and Baudelaire wrote the lyrics for it. And also, really frustratingly, the manuscript entered a private collection in the 60s and um, I'm hoping it might re-emerge soon so that I can see it. Um, but I can't say anything more about it other than we know that it exists. But there's another hypothesis um, from the mid-1850s as well, 
that this poem might have been written in collaboration with Pierre Dupont, who was a chansonnier with whom Baudelaire was very, very close friends. He admired him, and he wrote two um, critical articles about Dupont um, during the 1850s and 60s, one which serves as a notice to the first volume of Dupont's Chant et Chanson of 1851, and then there was another article he wrote 10 years later in the Revue Fantaisiste. And in the 1861 article, Baudelaire specifically draws attention to one of Dupont's um, poems, I'll call it that, but in fact, as you'll see from here, it is also a song, La Promenade sur l'eau. So on your handout, you've got the full text of that in the far left column. Um, even if you don't read French, it doesn't matter. The, uh, the key thing is that you see that it's got um, very, very similar structure of, of eight syllable lines and then a, a, a verse refrain. The vocabulary is very, very similar as well. The promenade sur l'eau, so, you know, the walk down by the water. Now, Charles Mouras claims that this promenade sur l'eau has very strong resonances with Baudelaire's Le Gédou. d'eau. So it's got the same form with the refrain structure, although there is a different meter in the refrain. It's got very similar aqueous imagery. There's a link between the love of a woman and a watery scene. So all the vocabulary, just even the, the very opening lines, both poets are talking about the, their uh, mistress having their eyes closed. Um, but I think the links are a little bit tenuous. It's quite an enticing uh, link, but I think they're a bit tenuous because I think the dates are a little bit unhelpful, but I'm not going to go nitpicking around that for now. Baudelaire's editor, Claude Pichois, hypothesizes that maybe Dupont was going to set Baudelaire to music in the fourth volume of his Chant et Chanson, um, but nothing has materialized, or at least none of the texts in the fourth volume of, Baudelaire, of Dupont's Chant et Chanson are Baudelaire's. And I've not yet been able to get any of the tunes in Dupont's Chant et Chanson to fit Le Gé d'eau. I've checked whether you can sing um, Baudelaire's Le Gé d'eau to this melody of La Promenade sur l'eau, but you can't because the meter doesn't fit. Um, that's because in part of um, the rhyme words being masculine rhymes and Dupont's, where Baudelaire's are feminine rhymes, um, they're the other way around. So I, I can't, for example, do to the tune that's up there. Um, it all goes wrong. I can try, but it doesn't work. It's a shame, but um, i tested it out anyway, okay? Um, uh, you know, from that miniature example I've given you there, Dupont was really not a very fine composer or musician. But his ideas about popular song are resonant, and the fact that Baudelaire really, really did it, admire and, and spend a lot of time with Dupont are, are important. So in the preface to these chants et chansons, um, coming just after Baudelaire's notice, Dupont writes this about popular song. Again, I'll read in, English, uh, in French. Quels sont les airs qui restent populaires Ceux qui réveillent les plus vifs sentiments d'amour, de liberté, d'indépendance, les sentiments intimes, assez vrais, pour vibrer dans tous les cœurs purs. And what's telling us about Dupont's comments here are his insistence on the strong feelings or sentiments that get all hearts vibrating, irrespective of the actual language used. And these sentiments stay with us. In Dupont's terms, il reste populaire. And that's not necessarily a negative reflection of how song functions. They stick with us because they strike the right chord. And here I'm going to be a little bit bold. This, I think, gives us a, a big clue as to why Le Gé d'eau ends up being set to music a number of times in the 1880s and 1890s, as I demonstrate here. There are at least three different songs um, that are written, and quite a number of textual reworkings, including a, a parody by La Fogue, which is the third text you've got in your handout, which I'm basically not going to talk at all about today, but it's there, and it's part of the whole nexus. For me, the decision by composers to set Le Gé d'eau to music comes not because the poem is of itself somehow musical, because, but because its sound well sticks with us. It creates some kind of enduring, vibrating sentiments that last, no matter which version of the song it's performed as. But how then should we sing Le Gé d'eau? Well, scholars have already dealt in with quite a bit of precision, uh, a bit of detail, with the issue of precision in, or imprecision in declamation, whether we should read the poem first, and different singing styles or techniques, whether you use melodic rubato or portamento. But each of those approaches don't engage with the fact that there were very different schools of declamation in the 19th century. Um, scholars in the room have dealt with that. And crucially, and this is where my interest is, that there are different versions of the text and what ends up being set to music. So rather than talk about the technical specificities of performing Debussy's vocal works, I want to look at the performance contexts and what these tell us about singing Debussy. Uh, 
And that means class and gender issues. It means whether it's elitist or non-elitist, some kind of political dimension maybe to it. But most of all, it also means the aesthetic agenda behind all this. The popular song context that I've touched on very briefly is, I think, rather telling, because when Debussy comes to set Baudelaire to music between 1887 and 189, he's still in the relatively early stages of his career as a songwriter. And he creates the settings at precisely the time when composers are exploring the relationship between chanson as something more lowbrow and light and melodie as a more high art French uh, song. And that's why I want to situate Debussy's 1889 setting of Le Jet d'eau in between the two other settings of the same poem. Maurice Rollinat's one, from, which I think is 1883, although it wasn't published until the 1890s, and Gustave Charpentier's 1890 setting, which wasn't published until 1895. So Rollinat, um, for those of you who don't know him, was very much um, a café concert, uh, poet and uh, singer. He used to self-accompany at the Chat Noir, um, and his song setting of Le Gé d'eau is a relatively simple song. Um, he uses a very classic technique of switching between the major and the minor. Um, so in the two segments, so in the bit which is addressing his mistress, um, it goes, tes yeux sont là pour amande. And then in the descriptive bits, it just switches into the major. Dans le col, le qui jase. And that's his, that's his whole harmonic structure for the whole thing. By the time we get to the refrain with Rolina, it's a very simple refrain. I've just popped the score up there. I realize the light isn't great for that. Um, he's gone back into the minor key, it ends up on a top B flat, but Rolina was a, a light lyric tenor who could just do that as his kind of showpiece, if you like. So, the context here of the Rolina setting is Café Concert, light-hearted, Rolina himself uh, performing it. By contrast, Debussy's setting was first performed in private at Chausson's house in 1890, so another composer. We don't know, I'm afraid, unless someone in the room can correct me, who the singer was. So we don't even know whether it was a male or female singer. We assume it was Debussy himself at the piano, um, as that image, uh, famous image um, from the house demonstrates. We know that uh, the first public performance was in Lyon by a, a, a male singer, and then there was a premiere of the full set of the Saint Poem in 1905, performed by a female singer. So I'm just kind of giving a little bit of the context there that initially private, private performance and it doesn't go onto the public stage until it's the, the, the songs have been re-edited by Durand in 1902. Okay, so we've got Rolina, Café Concert, it's really more intimate private initially. And then I'm going to touch on Gustave Charpentier, where we have a completely different performance context. I don't know any of the details yet of uh, the premiere of Le Gé d'Eau's, um, Charpentier's setting of Le, Le Gé d'Eau, but we know that when Charpentier was working towards, um, working on his setting, he was working towards setting up this rather brilliant conservateur populaire for working class women in Paris who were mostly, or at least initially, seamstresses, um, as per the main character of his famous opera, Louise. And, uh, Given the nature of his setting, it seems highly likely that this was the performance context for it. In some respects, however, given Charpentier's improving project for these women, he basically had rather uh, socialist rhetoric, uh, was tempered nonetheless by his very patriarchal attitude. He was very much the, the man in charge, helping out all these, these delightful women. You can see him. Uh, he's, he's the guy with the best cravat, basically, in the picture with all the, the lovely women. Um, but it's a strange choice for Charpentier because this is not a neutral poem at all. Um, it doesn't just describe a pretty sounding fountain and the way it reminds him uh, of his love for a woman. It's almost overtly erotic or at the very least intensely sensual. So it's not the kind of naive poem that you might expect to be more appropriate for such women to sing. What Charpentier's setting does do, however, is reveal a very different scope for this song. And even if you don't read music, you can notice that we have two lines here for the setting of the refrain. Effectively, this is to be performed by female mini-chorus, uh, or a chœur lointain, they're supposed to be slightly off stage. And so we're no longer in a sort of intimate performance space and sound world. Here we hear multiple voices in the collective singing of the refrain. <laughs> 
But the performance trajectory is, in fact, a little bit more complex than this. So I've, I've said that we basically go from private to public, we go from small scale to large scale, from the elitist bohemian bourgeois in the no audience to more amateur performers and audiences in the Charpentier domain. But it is a bit more complicated because there are some textual variants. Debussy, bless him, chose to set a completely different version of the refrain to anybody else. So on uh, the left there, in refrain one, that is the standard published version of the refrain um, of Baudelaire's text. Refrain two exists only as a footnote in the first publication of, of, of Le Gé d'eau, In la Petite Revue, which is just a, a small um, uh, journal. If I just flick to that slide there, you can see there's a footnote right down in the bottom, which is entitled Variante du Refrain, the, a variant of the refrain. Um, it's the only place it's published, so we can only assume that Debussy must have had um, uh, his hands on this at some point, or had knew someone who did. But actually, when Debussy selects refrain two, he gets a word wrong, or he deliberately changes the word. That's what I'm not sure about. Um, so the, the refrain one is essentially the more symbolic refrain. Instead of talking about the moon directly, it uses the term Phoebe, you know, the goddess associated with the moon. Or instead of talking about, you know, specifically the spray, the gerbe, as being specifically about water or specifically being a spray of flowers, um, in refrain one, we don't, we don't know that. It's in refrain two, however, it's completely direct. It's, it's straightforward for us. It's a spray of water, la gerbe d'eau, and we get the moon there in line three, que la lune traverse. And that's an unusual decision by Debussy because people, scholars, um, often tend to say, oh yes, he's selecting symbolic language, which will be the most resonant with the whole musical sound world. But no, Debussy selects the plain, simple, straightforward refrain, and he changes the word lueur uh, to pâleur. Um, it's not a radical change in meaning. I suspect he did it either just because it was a, a slip he misremembered, and David Grayson was talking a little bit yesterday about some of those slips, or simply because pâleur is easier to pronounce when sung. What Debussy's choice of refrain also reveals, however, is that um, both, although both versions of the refrain technically have the same metrical line lengths, they're, they're, they're all still six and four, they require a different scansion, by which I mean the Debussy refrain uh, demands more of an enjambement that you're expected to carry on between the two lines in the way that the standard refrain doesn't. Or at the very least, you can read it with one breath. And if you're not convinced by that, very simply, you can't sing the standard refrain, so refrain one, to the vocal line that Debussy has written, because the stresses or accents of the musical line fall in completely the wrong place. So if I put up the score of Debussy to refrain, and those of you who were at the concert last night would have heard Sophie singing this, um, it goes... <laughs> Whereas if I try and put the standard refrain, it would be la mille fleurs, which is a very, very weird thing to do with the word épanoui. <clears throat> and apologies, I should have taken a swig of water first. What's even more interesting then with Debussy, apart from choosing the unusual refrain, is that he then later orchestrates his setting of Le Gé d'eau around 1907. Even though we know from letters to André Kepler that he was rather resistant to the idea of orchestrating any of his melodies. And if I can borrow a comment uh, from Dick Langham Smith, he chooses to set Le de to music as if perhaps it was too important to be confined to the recital room, and that interests me. Um, the orchestrated version was performed at the Concert Cologne in February 1907, um, but the orchestration that you often hear on recordings now is actually a revised version by Kepli. So there is, for me, a complex relationship here between the intimacy of the poetic text and of its first context, if you like, and the far broader scope of its later versions. And this, for me, I think is further complicated by both the personal and professional relationships, which were not always uncritical, between Rollina, Debussy and Charpentier, so the three 19th century composers who set Roger d'eau to music. We know they all hung out together in venues such as Chez Thomen or the Brasserie Poussy, but we also know that Debussy wrote rather scathingly of Charpentier's populist streak, um, especially in his music. So I've just given you an example there from a letter to um, the Prince um, Poniatowski. Um, you know, there's a total absence of, of, of oh, yes, where is it? It's down there. A total absence of taste, um, what you might call the triumph of the brasserie. Yeah. <laughs> 
What I've tried to do then today is to do something slightly different from what I've done before. Uh, from the tendency to deal with Debussy's choice of poems in isolation, or at least only in relation to other poems of a set, so you tend to look at the Saint Poem, the Baudelaire, and what he's done with the Saint Poem. Instead, I've been trying to focus on the broader soundscape or performance context of each of the poems that Debussy set to music. Now, I obviously don't have time today to do more than one example from Le Gédou, but I hope that by setting out the whole scope of the textual, intertextual, and intermedial material surrounding Le Gédou, we can see that there is a whole poetic backstory to it, as well as all its future reworkings um, that inform Debussy's work in terms of what it means to sing, what a text, uh, what, uh, you know, can a text sing without music, what is song, what kind of song is it? And my emphasis on the sound or the sounding out of Le Gédou, is because I think what's at, what is at stake is that we need to listen carefully, and to listen for the sake of sound rather than necessarily for the sake of meaning. When we listen to Debussy for the sake of sound, as Marc Devoto has explored, we find the very distinctive patternings and clusters that create his sound world. So in Le Gédou, those of you who heard it last night, it means an emphasis on the major seconds that you hear at the very start um, in the piano part, and then on the classic ninth chords and whole tone scales that inform Debussy's language. When we listen to Baudelaire for the sake of sound, we find that not only does he enjoin us in the final stanza of Le Gédo to écouter la plante éternelle, to listen to the eternal lament of the, final, of the fountain, but also to an eternal song. It's that sort of la plante éternelle, which can be heard if we listen out for it. And Baudelaire's engagement with the sounding out of poetry, and not just the sound of his poetry, but the act of making his poetry sound and of making his poetry sound as music. It's that that sears it in our memory and preserves it for future generations. Or, to use Baudelaire's own words when he writes of Dupont's songs, and that should be on the next slide, they are destinés à se graver éternellement dans toutes les mémoires. Whilst Baudelaire is perhaps deploying a slight touch of hyperbole here, his emphasis on how the relationship between poem and music makes Dupont's songs forever memorable points towards a concept that is only recently attracting any serious critical attention. So, recent work by um, the Words and Music scholar Lawrence Kramer has begun to explore the idea of speaking melody or melodic speech, where I've given you the full quote, but essentially to paraphrase it. The absence of words still resonate with a particular melody that was once joined with words, just as the absence of melody still resonates with a particular text that was once joined with music. And this, I think, reveals why song is not just a merging or a conjoining of words and music. It's something more hybrid, more porous, in terms of the interactions which derive from the sounding out of the work. So the absence of Victor Robillard's um, 1853 music doesn't mean it resonates any the less for that, but it's, and the testimony to that is the numerous other sonorous musical song reworkings of the poem that I've tried to explore briefly today. And whilst I can't always prove, for example, that Debussy had heard the Rollinat and the Charpentier settings of Le Gédo, although I think it's highly likely, my point is that the other settings are already heard within Baudelaire's poem. The same tune can be sung to different possible words just as much as the same words can be sung to different possible tunes. There are inevitable problems and hiccups along the way, and that's why it's so difficult to make sense of this material, which is in and of itself at once harmonious and discordant. So to conclude, what an effect I'm proposing is a sort of Mallarmean reading experience, as Joe was just touching on. Acknowledging that Debussy is one of the most sensitive readers of poetry and would have been very familiar with this process, where we're expected as readers and listeners to reread, to re-listen, all the while suspending and suppressing one version and foregrounding and exposing another different musical version or adaptation of the same soundscape the poet presents us with. So we're expected to be careful listeners so that all the songs we actually do hear or sing are only ever songs alongside, a term I exploit from the idea of parody, justement, we have a parody here as well, which we can understand as para or de, uh, alongside uh, singing, if you like. So the sound of the fountain is eternal song, where Baudelaire's own poem as song is only ever part of a whole series of possible different variations, adaptations and reworkings, including Debussy's, that sit parodically alongside that eternal song. Thank you. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.